Good evening, everybody from Australia. Um, I'm really honoured to be able to speak at this forum. I was asked to talk initially about uh, our response to sepsis, but suddenly COVID and uh, antimicrobial stewardship and resistance creeped into the title. So I will address those very uh, at a very high level about our approach. But as we heard earlier, these are pillars about how we address sepsis, infection control, uh, preventing uh, antimicrobial resistance. So I think there is a, definitely a linkage there. It is important to, I guess, just set the scene. In, in Australia, um, our government is quite fragmented, which people probably wouldn't realise. We have a very strong Commonwealth government which looks after primary care and a um, very strong state governments that look after delivery of health services. And there's often a disconnect because they come from different political parties and therefore that impacts often on how we implement our health services, no matter how good the planning is. One thing that we do have, I think, which strengthens our health system is good intermediate um, agencies. So we have two agencies in relation to what I'm talking to today, the Australian Institute for Disaster Resilience that handled the COVID-19 response, and also the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality, which has a, a whole of health uh, scope in terms of primary acute and aged care in setting regulatory standards to improve quality of care. And a key remit of those organisations is engagement with uh, professional organisations such as Sepsis Australia and the George Institute to drive uh, from an, an evidence-based quality improvement. So if we take uh, COVID-19 in Australia, for example, we were in a very privileged position. We are geographically isolated. COVID hit us fairly late and it was primarily the Omicron variant, which meant that the severity was relatively low. But nevertheless, in a very short period, over 10 million people in Australia, which represents close to half of our population, has contracted COVID. Though luckily, I'm happy to say our death rate was relatively low. To address COVID, we had national plans. But as I said before, derailing those national plans implementation was this political divide and uh, a lack of cooperation at that level. So they had to implement a crisis cabinet to try to get cooperation across the states and territories. Uh, which did actually achieve quite a good of, um, a number of deliverables in terms of deploying medical stockpiles. But there was also a number of draconian measures put in place. We had international borders shut for two years. We were locked off from the world. Internally, state borders between the different states were locked down. And personally, for me, that meant that I was unable to return to my home for five and a half months because I got caught out of my state at the time that the closure happened. We had extended lockdowns. So in Victoria, you see there, that they had the second longest lockdown in the world for 260 consecutive days. We had delayed vaccination orders and tests availability. So despite all of those challenges, we still managed to keep our, um, our death rates down and, our, uh, and the acuity was down. And it really comes down to good local public health response and, and the clinical staff and health services. So currently today, as of yesterday, we have 10 million cases uh, cumulatively, and we've had about 14,000 deaths, which relatively is very low uh, when you consider other countries. The thing that actually I think drives change in Australia is this strong national quality improvement agency, uh, the Australian Commission Safety and Quality, and they set up an, an accreditation process which all health services can, uh, need to subscribe to. And the reason why it's important is because it impacts on funding and their, and their academic status and the types of services they can offer. And they have a number of different core standards which are listed there, which guide all different types of clinical specialties. Now, the thing about this linkage symbol down the bottom is that this framework links together a whole number of different standards. And underneath that sits the sepsis clinical care standard. In re response to the World Health Assembly, Australia de um, developed a Stopping Sepsis National Action Plan in 2017, and it involved government, health policy, professions, clin clinicians, and what, most importantly, sepsis survivors and their families. And they're able to come up with a consensus on four strategic priorities and 12 recommendations. And the priorities really were around uh, having national coordination with which Sepsis Australia is led on, increasing awareness and education, having national standards of quality of care and improving post-sepsis support. And you can see the list of 12 
uh, recommendations there. And I'm happy to say that five years in, we've de de uh, delivered on 90% of those recommendations with a bit more work required on national sepsis awareness campaigns and education for undergraduates in particular. So through that collaboration with the Australian Commission, we then developed the National Sepsis Program. We had no funding to deliver the plan. Um, funding was coming from non-expended funding from research institutes, for example. But we were successful in lobbying, lobbying government for partial funding. And so through that um, a collaboration with the Commission, we began a piece of work. And the first part was to develop, uh, to undertake a number of pieces, commission research that looked into, the, into subject areas such as early detection and triggers, epidemiology, public awareness, costing, and post uh, sepsis survivor rates. And interestingly, as we found was sepsis is increasing, but death rates decreasing, long-term complication rates, and that the readmission rates to hospital after 90 days is around 40% and up to 70% after a year. And this was a huge driver for change, particularly at the health uh, department level at the states and territories. From that collaboration, we produced the National Sepsis Clinical Care Standard, which was uh, launched in June 2022. And health services have up to 18 months leeway to uh, implement the requirements. And the process for the standard is essentially looking at the gaps in service provision to see where the variation is and what the safety and quality issues are around sepsis, around awareness, recognition, post-sepsis care, for example. Then getting consensus around what are the potential areas that can be prioritised and what can be measured in terms of improving patient outcomes and developing a number of quality statements which then drive change at the health service level. Importantly, it defines who should do what when um, and it's broken into health service requirements about what they need to supply, clinicians what they need to do and consumers or survivors or patients about what they should expect. An important aspect of this was that we had strong endorsement across the sector from multiple different organized, professional organisations. So the standard itself is based on seven quality statements. Could it be sepsis is meant to empower clinicians and consumers to actually ask is it sepsis with, a, with junior clinicians expected to have to rule out sepsis rather than rule in sepsis. So it's always default uh, secondary diagnosis if we're unsure. The time critical management in terms of pathways are implemented. Antimicrobial therapy commenced in 60 minutes. Multidisciplinary coordination of care with a single point of contact to coordinate care from admission to discharge. The patients are educated so they actually know they had a diagnosis of sepsis to take that back with them in, back into the primary community. That when patients are going through different settings and handover, that sepsis is actually communicated, that it's not lost as a, as a diagnosis instead of just the primary diagnosis of a chest infection, urinary tract infection, etc. And that there is a coordinated proactive model of care. To support implementation, which is really important to make sure that it, we're not actually prescribing implementation, we're giving us the, the uh, standards we want them to work to, but the implementation is supported by these resources that you can see in terms of discharge planning guides, fact sheets, such as antimicrobial fact sheets and lactate, for example, and consumer fact sheets as well. To allow um, health services to work out how well they're tracking, there's, tool, there's tools have been developed into a clinical indicator monitoring tool for each of the statements and a self-assessment tool, which allows them to do a gap analysis in terms of their readiness to deliver. So the clinical care, sepsis clinical care standard has been launched. We're in the process now of working with health services to implement and uh, where we're at the moment is they're doing gap analysis and forming local working parties. Just touching on antimicrobial stewardship, similarly like sepsis, we have a national standard with a number of quality statements and uh, that is used to drive antimicrobial stewardship improvements which are linked back to the sepsis clinical care standard and linked to the national accreditation program. Underpinning that stewardship standard is good antimicrobial resistance surveillance. And we have a process called Aura, which collects patterns and trends of antimicrobial resistance and antimicrobial use across Australia. And that then drives uh, changes in the quality statements and emphasis about variations of care going forward. So the takeaway messages I think that I'd like to just convey to this evening is to say that an intermediary agency with a national remit of engagement, strong engagement that um, it brings in all the different various stakeholders is absolutely essential to, to, to um, bridge that divide between government level and health service delivery level because it allows us to make sepsis a mainstream condition, not 
and in a standalone silo condition, which means it's always thought of when there's quality improvement. And that a, a, a key um, objective also is to make sure we are able to sell the benefits of investment in sepsis in terms of the impact on health services, patient outcomes, costs, and other deliverables such as that. Thank you.